Hello, good morning and good evening. Uh, Ambassador Chi, distinguished panelists, and our almost 500 uh, registered online participants, welcome you all to uh, ICAS 2020 annual conference on the prospects for the US China relations after US presidential election. My name is Nong Hong. I am the executive director of the Institute for China and American Studies, an independent think tank based in Washington, D.C., which aims at facilitating the exchange of ideas and research on many of the key issues uh, that are fighting and concerning the U.S.-China relations that are in great need of greater mutual understanding. Uh, the bilateral relations between the two has never been tested so uh, severely as it is today. So in 2020, we're facing old and new challenges which continue to shape one of the world's most important bilateral relations and which must be addressed constructively. Under this background, the ICAS 2020 annual conference aims at identifying the existing risk stemming from the US China strategy competition. And we will also address uh, many of the bilateral and transnational challenges such as trade, high technology, climate change, environment protection, ocean governance, among others. We look forward to the distinguished panelists' contribution to the discussion on what we may expect for the future bilateral relations the new administration of the United States. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank our co-organizers and the strategy partners the National Institute for the South China Sea Studies, and China Institute, the University of Alberta, and the China Program at Carter Center that work together with ICAS for many of our events. We are delighted to have the leadership of ICAS partner institution with us today, uh, Dr. Wu Shichun, Professor Gordon Holden, and Dr. Liu Yaowei. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Wu Shichun, President of the National Institute for Social and Sea Studies, who also served as the Chairman of Advisory Board of ICAS to give a remark. Dr. Wu is a leading expert on maritime studies and particularly with the focus on the South China Sea. Now I'm going to give the floor to uh, Dr. Wu Shichun. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hornung. Uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador Chi Ting Kai, uh, President uh, Stephen Owens, Professor Graham Harrison, Professor Gordon Holden, uh, Dr. Liu Yawei, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to my American uh, participants and a good evening to our Chinese participants. Let me begin by expressing my warm welcome to all of you to the annual meeting of the Institute for China American Studies. I appreciate your participation in the discussion and despite uh, your uh, busy schedule, uh, I mean, uh, for the speakers and the participants uh, from both the United States and the China and uh, Canada. Uh, so, in my opinion, uh, this annual meeting is special, significant, and timely, where we are going to look at uh, the bilateral relationship between China and the United States during the Biden administration. So as we know, in the United States, a Democrat Joe Biden won the presidential election in early November and then will take over the White House in January 20th, 2021. The world is looking forward to positive changes in the US foreign policy and the China-US relations. So over the past four years, the Trump administration Unilateralist policies uh, have left the international system established after World War II riddled with the horse. China-US relations have fallen to their lowest point since the two countries established the diplomatic relations in 1979. And the strategy of comprehensive suppression and containment, the United States has launched the trade war technology war and a media war against China, leading to the free fall of the bilateral relationship. On the South China issue, the US military is stepping up uh, actions against China and openly take sides. This shift in position 
has pushed the competition between the two countries in the South China Sea, especially in the military field, on the brink of out of control. After the end of the US election, the whole world has placed high hopes on Biden to lead the United States back into the family of nations, back to the multilateralism and back to cooperation in addressing common challenges uh, in the world. So in his hometown speech in Wilmington, Delaware on November 24th, Mr. Biden said he would pivot from American first nationalism of the Trump administration, steer away from unilateralism and return to multilateralism. This is a positive signal from my perspective. For its relations with China, we hope that the US administration will be less confrontational and more cooperative, less uncertain and more predictable and pursuing less strategic competition and more dialogue and communication. In fact, the Trump administration's persistent suppression and containment of China has not only failed to make China kneel down, but also frustrated and even repelled China's political elites and the young generation aspiring to the United States. The American dream was shattered. Rather than consolidate its hegemony in the Asia Pacific, the United States has created a dilemma for its allies and partners who have lost confidence on this superpower. So return to normal track of dialogue and cooperation is the only option for China and the United States to maximize their interests, which also serve the interests of the other countries in the world. China and the United States have more shared interests than differences in global economic recovery, fight against COVID-19, global governance, climate change, and the regional security challenges. This means huge potential and a space for cooperation between the two countries on bilateral, regional, and global issues. According to the World Bank, global GDP will contract by 5.2% in 2020, the worst recession in decades, and is expected to grow by 4.2% in 2021. But this goal cannot be achieved without the full cooperation between China and the United States. In particular, if the two countries are unable to achieve a trade truce, it would make a global economic recovery much more difficult. Since the establishment of diplomatic relations in 1979, China and the United States have experienced quite a few crises including Taiwan Strait crisis in late 1990s and the fighter jet collision in the South China Sea in 2001. Uh, when I was uh, deeply involved in that accident uh, in dealing with that issue, but eventually we solved this uh, sensitive and complicated, complicated issues uh, through dialogue and cooperation uh, within two weeks. So however, as long, as long as the two sides could rebuild mutual trust and build a bilateral relationship based on dialogue and cooperation and mutual benefit, China and the United States more often than not have seized the new opportunities for development after new crisis. Although the United States and China relationship cannot back to the past. The two countries can work together to create a more brighter future. So it is my sincere hope that this conference will find viable solutions to keeping China-US relations under control and non-confrontational with more dialogue and cooperation during the Biden era. So finally, 
I wish th this event a complete success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu, for your excellent remark. And I certainly share your hope for the potential change to the bilateral relations and to the global issues which may be brought by the administration of the United States. Now, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Chi Tian Kai and Chinese Ambassador to the United States and Professor Graham Allison from Harvard University to share their view on the US-China relations. And this keynote dialogue will be moderated by Mr. Steve Allens, and he's the president of the National Committee on the United States-China relations. So prior to his many rich experience working for uh, many of the nonprofit organization and practicing law, Mr. Allen served in office of legal advisor of United States Department of State. And while in that office, he was a member of the legal team that helped establish the diplomatic relations with China. Mr. Allen, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I'm looking at the, the, those pictures of, uh, of Tsui Tian Kai and Graham Allison, and I, I have to say you're much more handsome on Zoom than in those pictures. Maybe you should update the pictures, <laughs> but it's wonderful to host um, two old friends for this, this incredibly important conference at this incredibly important time. I want to congratulate Hong Nong and Hu Shuchuan on bringing together some of the great scholars in the United States on, uh, on US-China relations. And, and it's wonderful to, to have, you know, to be able to sit through and hear this, this whole panel today, which is gonna be very, very interesting and timely. Um, I won't spend a lot of time introducing Ambassador Tsui and, and, and Graham Allison, because if you're on this call and you don't know who they are, I'm not sure what you're doing on this call. Um, it's, you know, they're two of the leading kind of, uh, Ambassador Tse obviously is one of China's great diplomats. He has now been ambassador to the United States for the longest period of time as any Chinese ambassador. It's now seven years. Um, so congratulations on serving that long. And Graham Allison is one of the leading thinkers um, on kind of America's relationship with the world, obviously was in the Defense Department and is the author of this wonderful book which I keep by my side, destined for war, crash mark, and American and China escape the Thucydides trap. So I get, if you wanna, I, I would like to actually start with that um, and ask first Ambassador Tse and then uh, Dr. Allison, um, are we in the Thucydides trap? And what can we do if we are, what can we do to avoid it? And try to keep, because I want to make this a conversation, try to keep your answers to, you know, three, four minutes, and then we can go on to the next question. Because I've got a, a list of 74 questions and only 40 minutes to ask each of them. <laughs> Ambassador Tse? Well, thank you very much, Steve. And good morning and good evening to everybody. Let me first of all thank Dr. Wu Sichuan for his opening remarks and thank Dr. Dr. Hong Nong for inviting all of us for today's event. I also want to wish everybody stay well and healthy for the holiday season. Now the year 2020 is about to end and this has been a very unusual year, probably a turning point in history. To overcome the pandemic, restore global economic growth, protect people's livelihood are still pressing priorities. At the same time, we have to recognize that the pandemic is actually reinforcing and accelerating some fundamental trends in the world that had emerged long before COVID-19. And the pandemic has also brought into sharp focus some major challenges that the global community has to respond to together if we want to build a better future. There are already discussions about how a post-pandemic world will look like and what kind of a global governance we need for such a world. And it is clear 
that the post-pandemic world will not be stable and global governance will not be effective without sound and stable relations between China and the United States. Therefore, it is time for reflection on this consequential relationship. This is not because of so-called failures of the past. The development of China-US relations ever since Dr. Henry Kissinger's first visit almost 50 years ago has brought tremendous benefits to the two countries and the whole world. Our reflection is necessitated by the fast and complex changes in the world, which present us with great opportunities as well as high risks. We have to have a shared vision for the future and make the right choice. We owe it to the people of both countries and the global community to keep the relations on a constructive track towards agreed goals. For China, the choice is clear. China and the United States stand to gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. Cooperation is the only right choice for both countries. As President Xi Jinping stated in his message of congratulation to President-elect Joseph Biden, the Chinese side stands ready to work with the US side in the spirit of no conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect, and a win-win cooperation. So that our two sides may focus on cooperation, manage differences, move forward China-US relations in a sound and steady manner, and together with other countries and the international community, advance the noble cause of world peace and development. Now we are about to enter the third decade of the 21st century. There are unprecedented needs for bilateral and global cooperation. Public health, climate change, a more inclusive and equitable process of globalization, advancement of science and technology that will improve the life of more people in more places, and so on and so forth. All these challenges call for enhanced international cooperation, including in particular, China and the United States working with each other, not decoupled from one another. Of course, there are always differences between the two countries. Many of them are part of the diversity of the world. None of them justifies confrontation and war, cold or hot. And with sufficient mutual respect and mutual understanding, we are capable of managing the differences so that they would not derail the entire relationship. A few years ago, my good friend, Professor Graham Allison, made a timely warning against the Thucydides trap. And he also quoted Shakespeare, that our destiny lies not in our stars, but in ourselves. So here again, nothing is written in stone. Everything depends on the choices we make. The zero sum game is an acrostic attempts to incite distrust and even hatred among different nations and different civilizations are extremely irresponsible. Those who are obsessed with great power rivalries already have their feet in the trap. Indeed, we should, based on a clear understanding of the new realities of today's world, join hands to build a new type of international relations and a community of mankind for a shared future. The first and foremost thing we have to do to be on the right side of history or to borrow 
Professor Allison's words, to bend the arc of history is to reject the outdated mindset. And the best way to avoid the trap is to open up a new path. This is the vision that we shall hold and a historic mission that we have to fulfill today. But are we up to it? So Steve, in response to your question, I raise another question. And thank you very I, much. I think that's a, it's a, it's a terrific opening. Um, I think I'll let Graham speak now, but then I'd like to kind of take it from 30,000 feet down to specifically what that means. But let me let Graham speak first. <laughs> thank you very much. And let me thank the organizers and uh, uh, the participants for this session, both this morning and this evening. And uh, to say what a pleasure it is to be with uh, Steve, but especially also with uh, the ambassador. Uh, until the coronavirus disruption, uh, I was in Washington about every week uh, uh, for the past four years. And one of the highlights of that was a continuing conversation with Ambassador Sway. Uh, I have teased him that uh, uh, not only is he the longest serving uh, and most outstanding ambassador in Washington today, but that I believe that uh, we're not gonna see the end of his boss Xi Jinping for quite a long time. And I've urged and believe and hope that he'll stay ambassador as long as uh, Xi Jinping remains the emperor. So uh, I think that uh, he may be with us for some time and I'm looking for improvement in the climate. So I'll get a chance to come back and continue the conversation. So on the question, just to go to the heart of it, uh, Steve, I think I agree very much with uh, what uh, uh, Ambassador Sway said. The answer is yes, the US and China are locked in a classic Thucydidean rivalry. So if Thucydides were watching in order to make a comment on what he sees in the relationship today, he would say, uh, these look like uh, almost the classic version of a rising power threatening to displace a ruling power. And they seem to be accelerating along a path uh, that should lead to the grandest coalition, grand, grand, grandest conflagration uh, of all times. So on the other hand, I agree very much with his proposition that this is the hand that the parties have been dealt. And so the structural realities are what they are, but how they play this hand uh, is up to them. So our destiny is not in our stars. There's no iron law of history that determines the outcome. It'll be the choices wise or foolish, that parties make. So I think the, uh, uh, yes, we're in a Thucydidean dynamic, but uh, I think actually as one of the folks who works directly for Xi Jinping uh, said to me once when I was in, in Beijing, he would say, he said, well, why do you think uh, Xi Jinping calls for this quote, new form of great power relations? He said, because he got a pretty good idea what happens in the traditional old form of great power relations if parties just let history take its course. So I think if we let history take its course, I think it's gonna turn out uh, badly, uh, extremely badly for both countries, but I don't see any inevitability in that. Now, this is extremely complicated for even us as academics or as policy uh, advisors or policy makers, but especially for governments, because I, 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 I now have come to think of it as uh, having to pass uh, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the Gatsby uh, guy, a test of a first-class mind. He said, a first-class mind has got to be able to hold two contradictory ideas in his head at the same time and still function. So on the one hand, for sure, the US and China are gonna be fierce Thucydidean rivals. And I think it's uh, actually clear that if Xi, if Xi Jinping's 
uh, realizes his version of the China dream uh, in his lifetime. Beijing will displace the US from positions of leadership it's become accustomed to uh, during an American century and especially in his neighborhood. Uh, so unless China can be persuaded to constrain itself as it grows into its uh, position as what will be the largest economy in the world, which it already is, the largest trading partner of everybody, which it already is, the manufacturing and the workshop of the world, which it already is. Indeed, the only big economy that'll be bigger at the end of 2020 than it was at the beginning. Everybody else is shrinking. So unless China can find a way to constrain the natural impulses, this will go turn out badly. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, unless the US can be wise enough to uh, cope with, uh, co coexist with, a rising China, this will also turn out tragically. So I think the, the challenge is to try to hold these two uh, competing ideas in our head at the same time. On the one hand, to be fierce rivals, which I think we will inevitably be, because I believe the US should be number one in everything. I'm very traditional, old fashioned American in that regard, even though I know that China is now the largest economy in the world measured by the best yardstick, PPP, that China is the biggest trading partner, that China is a fierce rival in the AI space and so forth and so on. So that's happening. That's uncomfortable. That's life. At the same time, I'm conscious that unless the US and China find ways to cooperate in some new form of great power relations, some third party incident like Taiwan or North Korea could drag us into a catastrophic war as surely as the assassination of the Archduke in 1914 brought all of the European powers to a tragic war. And secondly, and this is good news as the Obama, sorry, as the Biden administration takes office, Biden understands there's not only nuclear mad, nuclear mutual assured destruction, which would be the outcome if the US and China ended up in a war, but there's also climate mad, climate mutual assured destruction in which if the two greatest greenhouse gas emitters don't find ways to cooperate, we can create a biosphere that nobody can live in. So can we find a way to cooperate and compete at the same time? I think the answer is not easily, not comfortably, but uh, that's the challenge. The British empire rose and fell, the American empire then was created. There was not a values conflict between us and the British. How does the, and President-elect Biden has talked about a values-based uh, foreign policy. How does the values conflict uh, between the United States and China fit into your concept, um, Graham? And then Ken Kai, what can we do about that? Well, the ambassador and I have talked about this. So uh, uh, he's, he, he's rightly said that the American proposal is for China to get a DNA transplant. So if they would become just like us, you know, then we would get over this, uh, quote, values component of it. Uh, I actually uh, like most of all the chapters in my book, Destined for War, and Americans I've discovered, uh, I hate the chapter most, which is called, what if she's China were just like us? And uh, by this, I mean, just like us, as we entered what we were confident was gonna become an American century at the beginning of the 20th century, led by Teddy Roosevelt, who's one of my heroes. And if you look at what the US did in its relationship with Britain, in the period between, let's say, uh, when Teddy Roosevelt arrived in Washington in 1897, and when he left at the end of the first decade, the US behavior towards Britain would make what Xi Jinping has done so far seemed mild. 
So I, I won't rehearse the details, which you're familiar with, but we threatened war with Britain as well as with Germany, unless they backed off of a territorial dispute in Venezuela. We stole from Canada, which was the British colony at the time, the largest part of the fat tail of Alaska. Uh, so, uh, and said, if you want to fight about it, be our guest. Uh, so I would say uh, the values component of it is, a, is an element, but when I look at the, at the dynamics of a Thucydidean rivalry in the last 500 years, you've had cases in which you had values conflicts as well as cases in which you had values, values more closely aligned, but nonetheless were able to find a form of relations that didn't end in war, including with the Soviet Union and a Cold War, which is called war, but which actually uh, was, a, that was a metaphor. Uh, I count that as a case of success in the sense that we never ended up as two great nations destroying each other. Yeah. Okay. Tenkai. Well, Steve, uh, let me try. First of all, we take notes of all the statements, comments covered by the media. I mean, statements and comments from the Biden team that are reported in the media. I guess at appropriate time and at appropriate level, some communication and policy coordination would have to be done. But before January the 20th, we're still fully prepared to work with the current administration. We still have a little bit of time. And as Chairman Moore wrote in his poem, we should seize the day, seize the hour. I always believe it's never too late to do the right thing. Now let, let me come back to the word values. I think that the, the word values in the English language is a very interesting, even puzzling one. It has some conceptual and abstract sense, but it co could also mean something very concrete, very real and very material. So sometimes things are done by some people in the name of the abstract values, but in fact, they are trying to advance their material values. I don't know whether my understanding of the word is correct or not, but very often people talk about so-called universal values. But frankly, if these values are just derived from any particular civilization without taking into account the values of other civilization, I don't think that they are, or they could be called universal. And even so, in today's connected world, in a much globalized world today, there are common values, values held by people all over the world. And I want to bring your attention to the comments made by President Xi during his address to the General Assembly of the United Nations this year. He said, we should be guided by the values held by people all over the world, such as peace, development, equity, justice, democracy, and freedom. So there are still good values. I think that these values could be called universal values. And they are enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. So if somebody wants to base a foreign policy on these values, we have no problem. We are ready to work with them. The talking of seizing the moment, um, it's clear that the Congress, the American people, um, elites in the United States have a, a uh, very negative view of China. The polling suggests between 70 and 80% of Americans uh, disapprove of Chinese behavior. And Ambassador Tse, you said, seize the moment. Is China 
prepared to reopen the consulate in Chengdu to invite back uh, expelled American journalists back to China to unblock the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Post websites in China to do those things with a view of improving, because those help China with a view of improving China's image in the United States and creating what Dr. Kissinger did with ping pong diplomacy, uh, allowing, creating a foundation in the American people of a, of a positive view, which then allows the American government to take uh, more constructive action. So is China prepared to do something uh, before January 20th? Steve, I have to say, we did not initiate the closing of consulates. We were not the first one to ask foreign journalists to leave the country. We did all these things in response to actions taken by the United States. So if the US government is ready to reverse the cause, we are ready to look at it. And in order to put the relation on the right track, to have real improvement of the relation, I think both sides have to proceed with good will and good faith. I don't think that China should just do something to please anybody here, because we always stand for a stable and good relation with the United States. We never initiate all these provocative actions, but we have to defend our own interests. We have to respond. So it's um, kind of good faith for good faith, good will for good will. Yeah, I, I think that's true with respect. Well, it's true with respect to the consulate, it's true with respect to the expelled American journalists. It's not true with respect to the blocking of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter, et cetera. Those all occurred without any provocation. So those weren't tit for tat. Those were Chinese decisions, which were based upon Chinese government decisions, um, which were unilaterally taken. And the United States government did not respond to those. And I believe that those are not in China's interests. It's not a question of pleasing anybody. It's a question of, of basically laying a foundation at the people to people level for improved government relations. Steve, I don't think it's, it's a fact or it's even fair to say something is done without any provocation. There were provocation. If you look at what happened in the past year or so. Those occurred, those occurred 10 years ago. I, I, I don't know. The, 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 the blocking of those websites has been, has been for many, many years. You and I have discussed it many times. I think it's a mistake for the Chinese government to do it. Uh, the consequences far exceed any national security benefits. Why don't you talk to the Chinese journalists who were forced to leave this country in the last couple of years? Why don't you talk to Chinese scholars who are forced to leave this country in the couple, last couple of years? The, this occurred long before then, but uh, Graham. Um, it's very recent. It's very recent. The blocking of the websites of these various organizations, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter, occurred many years ago before President Trump took office. And whereas the consulate closing and the expulsion of a US journalists um, were in response to actions, those were not. Um, Graham, you've written about kind of uh, Biden will not be a third term uh, of the Obama China policy. Uh, should President Biden after January 20th address the Chinese people? Oh, there's a big question. Good. Uh, thank you. I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the 
pre, as he takes the oath of office, President Biden's going to inherit the most complex set of challenges any American president has seen for a long time. And most of those challenges are going to be right here at home, as he signaled very clearly. So he's going to have a huge agenda. Uh, uh, when, in, when he gets to the China issue, because he can obviously walk and chew gum and, and juggle and do five other things at the same time. I mean, I think it's very important to remember that this is not a, so a novice coming into a job that he's never seen before. This is a person very seasoned, very, very grounded, who has views that he's developed over a number of years. I think he will take some time to uh, get his bearings uh, and uh, try to develop, as I think uh, the, the ambassador said, some concepts that could actually provide a, a strategic rationale for a relationship with China, which will simultaneously be fiercely rivalrous, but also recognizing inherent necessity for thick co cooperation. And trying to find a way to articulate that will be a big challenge. In that context, I wouldn't be surprised if he wouldn't at some point try to speak not only to the Chinese people, but certainly to the world. Because again, he knows that uh, the challenges internationally are not only for US alone or America first. So I think you'll see, and I think for Ambassador Sway and his colleagues in their in, in embassies, they're gonna have a more challenging task than they had under uh, Trump. Under Trump, as, as the ambassador said at the beginning, no one did more to undermine relations uh, between the US and its allies than President Trump. Uh, I talked to again, a colleague in Beijing and he said, you know, we're having trouble figuring out our views about which of these two candidates we prefer, because for sure, we could never have succeeded in the way that Trump has in, in undermining confidence in America's Asian allies, the way that he's uh, done. So if he can keep this up, this is quite a good thing. On the other hand, his idiosyncratic and mercurial uh, character uh, uh, drives us crazy because we like order and you know more regularity. So I, th I think that uh, Biden understands very well, and as he signaled clearly, that rebuilding relations with America's uh, key allies and friends in the region will be a big part of his agenda. And that doesn't have, I think in that context, speaking uh, to all people, including the Chinese people, about the kind of relationship that he would hope that the US and China could develop might well be part of it. Yeah. The, the other part, of, the other end of that question, you know, after seven years, what do you, what do you think is the single greatest misunderstanding of China among the American people? And part of that question is, should President Xi address the American people about his, what he thinks US-China relations should be and kind of explain uh, what the Chinese government is about? Well, Steve, I think it's true. There's not sufficient mutual understanding. But what is more important, what is causing this lack of understanding is insufficient journeying will to have to acquire such understanding. And honestly, some of my American colleagues are still are not ready to have a journey in mutual respect. Without mutual respect, you can never acquire very good mutual understanding. For China's intention, for China's strategic goals, it's quite open. If you look at the recent the, the decisions made by the recent party plenum, if you look at a number of important speeches given by President Xi, both domestically and on international 
at, at international events in the last couple of months. China's goal for the next five years, 15 years, are quite clearly defined. It, it's just there. It, it's available to the public. If people have a genuine desire, if they make genuine efforts to reach, to acquire this kind of understanding, they can certainly do it. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Chinese president should have, should address the American people? You see, in the last couple of months, President Xi has addressed both Chinese and international audiences on many occasions. That international audience will certainly include the American people. And if you look at the message of congratulations he sent to President-elect Biden. The key message is very clear there. Mm -hmm. You've had a, an amazing run, seven years as the Chinese ambassador to the United States. What's, what do you feel has been your greatest success? What has, been, what has made you happiest during this seven years? Well, Steve, uh, to be more, Accurate, it's seven years and eight months. <laughs> <laughs> Who's so, counting? Who's counting? <laughs> seven years, eight months, 14 days and 34 seconds. <laughs> I, I think one of the things I have learned over the last seven years and more is that I certainly now have a better understanding of the complexities as well as potential of this relationship. But on the whole, I'm still confident if we can really work together, if there's a genuine desire on both sides to show mutual respect, to acquire mutual understanding, we can do a lot of good things together. We can make both countries great again. Graham, what do you, what do you worry about most? What keeps you up at night? And where do you think there's potential for what we used to call on Wall Street, the upside surprise, that something happens and it really kind of brings the countries together? In a lot of ways, I always thought that, you know, a pandemic, this is why it's a tragedy on a tragedy. I always believe that, you know, climate change, pandemic, economic crisis and terrorism were, were areas where it brought the United States and China together. And instead, this pandemic has just driven us further apart. Uh, even, and I hope there's a lesson in that that means we need to cooperate. But what do you worry about most at night? And where is there some potential for upside surprise? Okay, so two good questions. Uh, I would say on the worry side, which is probably what I do most of the time. Uh, uh, Taiwan is a great candidate for a ticking time bomb that could uh, lead to a tragic conflict. So again, not to re 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 rehearse the story of 1914, but I don't think you can uh, study that or think about it too often. It was absolutely incredible that two great countries uh, Germany and Great Britain, who actually were ruled by uh, cousins uh, who uh, vacationed together uh, and who had thick economic relations, so thick that the most popular book in Europe for the decade before 1914 was a book that said wars were, uh, were obsolete because economic relations would make them counterproductive. Norman Angel's book. So nonetheless, in those circumstances, something as otherwise inconsequential as the assassination of an archduke by some terrorists became a spark that produced a fire that produced a catastrophe. So in, in Taiwan, uh, the US and China have together for now 50 years uh, managed through under some rubric of, of ambiguity, uh, a degree of ambiguity, uh, a successful uh, run in which neither China nor Taiwan have ever seen such an extended period of prosperity or the US and peace 
with a lot of discomfort and a few crises and difficulties, but nonetheless. So could that go wrong? Absolutely. And I can give you five scenarios for doing that. North Korea, uh, we haven't heard from lately, but I would say stay tuned. So if they go back to testing ICBMs that could give them a reliable capability to strike the American homeland, I could easily imagine even in a Biden administration strikes on North Korea. And then where do we go from there? And we should remember the Korean War, which Americans and Chinese fought each other. So I think that's the downside. On the upside, I think the President Biden and his team understand more deeply than most of the strategic community, the dangers posed by climate disruption and unfettered greenhouse gas emissions. Biden quite serious about having a big climate initiative. Uh, from the Chinese perspective, their interests in this are even greater because the climatic consequences in China, uh, the more immediate ones come sooner than they come for the US. And certainly President Xi Jinping showed some appreciation of this earlier. So I could imagine the two parties finding some ways to say, we of necessity have to either find ways to address this problem by jointly doing things we wouldn't do otherwise and leading the world to do likewise, or we're gonna end up with a climate we can't live in. So we're not gonna do that. Now to work today and pay costs today on behalf of preventing a catastrophe that may not happen tomorrow, but in a decade or in five decades, extremely hard in terms of politics, especially for American politics. But I think that's part of what Biden is about. And I think his appointment of Kerry as basically the sole you know, uh, uh, leader for that initiative is reflective of the fact that this is gonna be a high priority for him, whereas for uh, Trump, it was not, a, not an issue. Yeah. Can I upside surprises? Well, Steve, uh, I just want to say, I certainly agree with you. Uh, there are important areas for closer cooperation between China and the United States. You mentioned quite a few, and I believe they are very good areas for cooperation. The pandemic, climate change, global economy, and counterterrorism. And I also agree with Professor Allison that we should, should not take it for granted that economic interdependence by itself could stop any conflict or confrontation. Under certain circumstances, closer economic ties may even make conflicts more possible. That's why we have to have a comprehensive view, have a clear understanding of the complexities of the relation. But still, it's quite clear, cooperation will make both countries winners and confrontation will make both us both of us losers. That, that's the basic choice we have to make. The, uh, I have not looked at the calendar, at the, uh, but when would the first, assuming it's not separately array, uh, arranged, when would the first meeting between uh, President Xi and President Obama occur at a G20 or some other? Obviously, you have to have a view on the pandemic, whether it's under control at that point, as to whether it's a, a virtual meeting or an actual meeting. But assuming the pandemic is under control, when is the first meeting scheduled to occur? Um, is, is for Tenkan, do you know the, I, I don't know the answer, or Graham? The, the, the only thing I've heard, uh, Steve, and I'm sure you have too, is that at least one of the ideas that's been discussed is an early meeting, uh, not yet called, of the G20 uh, to talk about the response to the pandemic as the vaccines become available. Because the current arrangement is one in which essentially, even though you've got a lot of fluffy talk at the G20 level and internationally about uh, the rest of the world, uh, each of the countries is pursuing its own vaccine first. Uh, but as vaccines roll out, which are now happening both in China and in the US, 
So you will in January be seeing this. Uh, I can imagine an early meeting of the G20, which could then be a, for a side comment. But still, I suspect that it'll be some time before these will be face to face. Yeah. Shenkai, do you, do you have a view on that and a view of the value um, of such a meeting early on? Or should, you know, President Biden has talked about, uh, in fact, in an, in an interview he gave to the New York Times, to Tom Friedman, talks about getting our alliances in order, what Graham referred to, rebuilding kind of American alliances and our relationships with our friends around the world. So we have a unified view on our policy towards China, that it is not the unilateral view, not, not America first, but America alone uh, in its policies. So my expectation is actually it will be quite a while before there is a arrangement for a independent separate meeting between President Biden and Xi. Obviously they already, there is no president in American history who has spent this amount of time, which I believe is 28 hours individually with President Xi, then President-elect Biden. Ken Kai? Well, Steve, uh, I, I think it's, it may be too early to talk about schedules for our leaders next year. We have to see how the, when and how the pandemic would be over and whether they will be able to have a uh, face-to-face -face meetings at all these international events like G20. But I remember the first presidential meeting between President Xi and President Obama was at the Sunnyland. Within three months after President Xi was elected president, it was very early on. And the first meeting, presidential meeting between President Xi and President Trump was at Mar-a-Lago. Also in the first few months of Trump presidency, I think that such top level communication and the working relationship they formed were extremely important and useful in guiding the relationship moving forward. And I have also read media reports that Mr. Biden might want to meet some of the US allies first or even have a conference with them. Well, it's his own decision, of course. Uh, I think what is really important is not whether you have a unilateral policy or multilateral policy, whether you have a, a American policy towards China or you have a a coordinated policy with your allies. What is really important is the nature of the policy. What kind of a policy you are going to adopt? If it's a policy of a kind of a containment or kind of a forming a so-called united front against China, then whether it's unilateral or multilateral, the difference is only that if you are dig the trap yourself or you are dig the trap with your friends. It makes no real difference. Graham, do you want to respond to that or should I? <laughs> I mean, I, th I think the, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I think we agree, but maybe we disagree. So let me try to see where we may disagree. I think that you will see a fierce rivalry between the US and China yesterday, today, tomorrow, and for a long time. Because I think the China dream foresees China as the predominant power in its neighborhood. And I think uh, many Americans still believe that the arbiter of events in the South China Sea should be the American Navy, that the arbiter of events in the region should be the US because that's a position we've enjoyed for now more than seven decades since World War II. Uh, and that's provided a stability and an environment in which all the nations have had a chance to grow. So quote, American leadership of an American land international order 
is very much part of the American agenda. And I think it'll be part of Biden's agenda. So I think this will be a fierce rivalry. And I think that's baked in to the structural situation. I do not though think that's inconsistent with holding another idea, which seems contradictory in our head at the same time, which is that if that's the only thing we're doing, the prospect of our dying together catastrophically is very high. So we're condemned to coexist because the alternative is to co-destruct. And that means finding specific areas in which we have to cooperate deeply. So Taiwan is a good example. North Korea is a good example. Uh, climate is a good example. Counterterrorism is a good example. But there's some of these that actually are so uh, there. I mean, mutual for those of us who are all cold warriors, it was a long time getting our head around the idea that Ronald Reagan finally expressed best. He said, a nuclear war cannot be won and must therefore never be fought. So that means however much I want to compete with the evil empire, which Reagan certainly wanted to compete with, I cannot let this end in a war because at the end of the war, I will have, the, 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 the war will have erased the US from the map. Yeah. So obviously that's not acceptable. So how to cooperate and compete at the same time, that I think is the challenge. Yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, I think Hong Nong is sending me a message. We need to wrap this up. I think Ken Kai is absolutely right. And then incomplete. So right in the sense that it matters what the policy is, absolutely right. But from an American perspective, uh, the unilateral policy is ineffective. And that if we have issues that we want to address with China, it should be on a multilateral basis. It should be. And that's what President-elect Biden is going to do, that it is going to be with with you know, our NATO allies, it is going to be with Japan, South Korea, with our friends. And China will need to, I think, adjust to dealing with a more um, united uh, policy. If there are issues of like export restraints that the United States puts on its companies, if other countries don't do it, it's totally ineffective. So the business simply goes to the EU or Japan or, or South Korea. Uh, if we sanction um, Chinese companies, but other countries don't, it's pointless, it's ineffective. So I think from China's perspective, of course, it's the content of the policy. From the American perspective, it's the effectiveness of the policy that those policies become much more effective, but absolutely right. It's what is the content gonna be and my hope is that it focuses on climate change, economic growth, pandemic relief and pandemic prevention and counterterrorism, and that the, the conflicting aspects of the relationship we, we work on managing. Tenkai, you wanna give some closing comments then? Well, Steve, I'll try, uh, I'll try to be quite brief. I know time is up. I think, first of all, we have to look at some of the questions at different levels. At one level, there are some fundamental trends in the world, like economic growth, the scientific and technological progress, and always the ongoing restructuring in the global economy, supply chain, and so on and so forth. These things are always there. They are more or less independent of whatever intention we might have as a country. And basically, any policy that is very much in line with these historical ties will succeed. Any policy that go, goes against these ties would fail. And at a different level is a national strategy, the national policy goals we set for ourselves. So I think we have to distinguish these two different things. 
And for China, our goal, our strategy is very clear. We are not seeking global dominance. Even when, I don't know when this will happen, even when we become the largest economy in the world, we are not seeking global dominance. As President Xi said, we stand for a global community with a shared future. So I think maybe someday it will be inevitable that China will become the largest economy in the world because we have four times the population of the United States. Of course, in per capita terms, it may take a long, long time for us to catch up. But it does not mean confrontation would be inevitable when we become the number one economy. They are, to, they are seen at different levels. Then Graham just mentioned a couple of issues. Uh, I think these issues are of a different nature. Taiwan is our core interest. What is at stake is China's unity and sovereignty. The Korean Peninsula is some international conflict we have been working together on and trying to find a solution. But of course, we can still find some common ground on both issues. For instance, peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait serves the interests of every, everybody, China, United States, and people in Taiwan. And peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula would also serve the interests of both countries and our other partners. So, we may have, uh, we, we may need more time to have more discussion on these issues. And I'm ready anytime you are ready. Then about Steve, what you said in the end, I think I have a question. What is the point to make the policy more effective if it is a, a wrong policy? Obviously, if our allies and we agree, it's the right, and friends agree, it's the right policy, then by definition, if we can all agree on it, 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 is, it is by definition a right, may be wrong, but it, we, by definition, it is a, a, a correct policy. So, so um, um, and that, by the way, to the extent we need to bring in friends and allies to our policy, that serves as a constraint on the policy, that we can't, uh, some of the policies that have been adopted over the last four years would be difficult to persuade the EU, Japan, South Korea, and others to agree to. So actually it will function as a normalization of American policies towards China. So I would argue it's not, it's really, it's not a bad thing. It's actually, a, it's a positive thing. Well, Steve, I, I'm afraid that you are overestimating some of the things. People are saying the China-US relationship cannot go back to the past. I think the same could be said about a number of other things, including, honestly, including your relation with your, some of your allies. Sure. But this is your business. Yeah, I, the, look, the, the President-elect Biden has put together a, a fabulous team. And each day we see more and more people. These are people who, who really understand the world, who understand diplomacy, who understand uh, alliances, who understand, yeah, I mean, this is, this will not be foreign policy by tweet. Um, but it's- my, uh, advice, my advice for them is, I hope they will have a good understanding of today's China. And Steve, talking uh, by about- By the way, everyone, everyone is calling, whether it's Democrats, Republicans, uh, the, the, Biden, the, the Biden administration, the soon to be Biden administration is calling for more understanding of China in the executive branch of the US government, that we need to train more people in Chinese. We need to have more people who have lived in China and gone to work in the US government. So there's actually a consensus in America that we do need that. But let me let Graham close because um, we, we are- Maybe just one last word. <laughs> Maybe just one last word. Uh, you see, when Mr. Biden was vice president, he was very much involved in U.S. relations with China. 
So I have heard him say more than once that sometimes unintended consequences could be worse than intended consequences. I think that this is a piece of very wise advice. Thank you, Steve. Graham, any closing words? I, I think that given the time, uh, uh, I won't try to comment on the various uh, items, only to say, I think the question <coughs> whether uh, President Biden and his team can hold two contradictory ideas in their head at the same time and still function is the question for them. And I'm quite uh, heartened by this. I think that if, if any US administration were to be able to do that, I think it's somebody like Biden who's so grounded and seasoned and has seen so much of this and indeed is a proud old Cold War veteran. So he's seen a rivalry which ended up not having a catastrophic war. And he's, as you said before, Steve, spent a lot of time with Xi Jinping and has a great deal of respect for, for him. I think from the Chinese perspective, it'll become even harder because as a nation is growing as rapidly as China has and is being restored to what Chinese regard is their rightful place from which they were displaced, the normal tendencies of a rising power are obvious in its behavior, in its attitudes, in its understanding. So I think again, Xi Jinping has shown himself to be a wise leader. I think in this formulation of the call for a new form of great power relations, he's got a good banner. And I think it'll be interesting to see whether the content of that could be one in which you could in effect say that also passes uh, Fitzgerald's test of a first class mind, holding these two very uncomfortably uh, contradictory ideas in our head at the same time and still functioning. So I'm optimistic. The, uh, this has been a fabulous panel. I, I, I can't thank both of you enough for this. Can't thank Hung Nong and Wu Shuchen enough for allowing me to moderate this. It's, uh, it's been frank, it's been constructive, it's been extremely useful. It never ceases to amaze me when I sit with Tian Kai um, and he can so articulately express kind of Chinese positions in a thoughtful, uh, constructive way. It's just terrific. I look forward to the day when we have uh, another American ambassador in China who can participate in this kind of conversation in Chinese, because I think your ability to articulate to American audiences Chinese policy um, in a way that they can understand it, that we need people in the US government who can similarly articulate US views to Chinese audiences. But it really, it's simply uh, breathtaking the way you, you, you can articulate this. And it's, you know, it's been great having you as ambassador for these seven years, eight months, 11 days, 12, <laughs> but it's terrific. And Hong Nong, thank you. Thank not, you all. We hope we played a great leaving. foundation. He's, he's not he's not being, going to be allowed to leave until his boss leaves. Okay? <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you no, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ambassador Che, Professor Allison, and President uh, Mr. Allings for setting such a great stage for the following discussion. I'm certainly inspired by a very candid dialogue in understanding the challenges and the potential opportunities for the bilateral relations for uh, a very uh, from both and policy and academic perspective.